Welcome. This session is on uh, troubleshooting. Now, some of you, there was a handful of you, eight or so, that took the uh, boot camp on troubleshooting. And for you, I apologize because you've already seen all this stuff. Um, that's okay. It, it's good to remember. So, troubleshooting Wi Fi. I started maybe uh, eight, ten months ago thinking, how do we start to to collect information on how to troubleshoot. We've taught uh, ECSE courses now on design to 5,500 people, so about 480 classes. We do a bunch of wireless design classes. But what happens after those classes is people go, cool, you just tell me how to do this. But what I really need to know is how do I troubleshoot? Now, I've always said from the design standpoint, if you design well, you don't need to troubleshoot. Now, that's actually not true. It just sounds cool. But it's also kind of true because if you, the infrastructure works exactly like you need, the infrastructure meets all the requirements, if there's a problem, you can point to the client device because my infrastructure is giving the clients exactly what they want. And so the big part about design is how do I make sure that my clients get what they need out of the infrastructure? And if they do, then I can then say it's not us, it's them. And I can point down to the device. But hearing this complaint, this request, I said, well, maybe we should develop a new troubleshooting class. CWAP has been around for, I don't know, Peter, how long has CWAP been around? 15 years? Yeah, so, yeah, long, long time. And CWAP is wonderful. Peter teaches a fantastic class. I try to sit his class at least once a year. Even though I teach CWAP, I want to sit Peter's class because every time I learn more. But CWAP is about the protocol. It's about the packet level. And it takes a good four days. And you've got to really be into packets. And by the way, I love it. But that's not for everyone to troubleshoot. So I want to come up with a new way, a paradigm shift of saying, how do we troubleshoot Wi-Fi? What kind of tools do we use? And can we make it access accessible for everyone? So, if Wi-Fi is so easy to do wrong, what? Yeah, Wi-Fi is really easy to make bad Wi-Fi. People do it all the time. Now, the problem with bad Wi-Fi is one, we need to understand why, and then two, see what the results are. So the understanding why part is, 20 years ago when they were developing the Wi-Fi protocol, they wanted it to be ultra robust super robust. And what they said was, we would like this protocol to work no matter what happens. It's a barcode scanner in a warehouse and someone turns a corner and I don't have signal or the signal drops 20 dB. I still want to be connected, so let's make it robust. How do we do that? We made the protocol slow down automatically. Ethernet, 10, 100 gig. If I connect them gig, it's gig. If someone pushes a uh, big file, it's still going to send over the Ethernet a gig. Wi-Fi, on the other hand, changes its modulation on the fly to adapt to whatever the problem is so it will stay connected. It's robust. But the cost of robustness is speed. So the number one complaint everyone has about Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is? And when it's Wi-Fi is slow, you should just go, yes! because Wi-Fi is doing exactly what it's programmed to do. It's programmed to go slow rather than drop. So they didn't say Wi-Fi doesn't work, Wi-Fi stopped, I can't, no, it's Wi-Fi slow. And it's made to go that way. Because of this robustness, we lost, as an industry, feedback. The instantaneous feedback that happens when you punch down a Cat5 cable and you swap pairs and you plug it in and you get no link light. Instantly you know that did not work. So you fix it now before anyone uses it. So what happens with the Wi-Fi is it's robust, it works no matter what you do, people install it poorly, wrong, breaking all the rules, and then it works. And until you're putting load on it, it works even though you break every rule. You put an AP in the hallway, Wi-Fi works. You put an AP above the ceiling tile, Wi-Fi works. You hang an AP on the wall like a clock, Wi-Fi works. You break the rules and Wi-Fi works. So you get people who go out to forums and post, look at what I did. I installed this great device in this thing. And we look at it and go, bad fi. 
but it works. And so they get reinforced that it works. And they see other people post, I did this thing, and it's wrong, but it works. So what we need to do is figure out how to get past that. So there's a troubleshooting process, and I'm not going to go through the detail of this. This is kind of from the CWAP old troubleshooting course, which was you go through this process to troubleshoot. And the problem is, how do I apply this if I don't know what's going on? It's a process, and you can apply this exact same process to wired, wireless, cooking, picking out shoes. I mean, it's just a process of, of solving issues. So what we need to do is figure out how to find the bottleneck. Some 20 years ago, I read this book, maybe 30 now, it's a long time, called The Goal. If you uh, haven't read it, strongly recommend you go read it. It's about processes. And in the story, there's a guy trying to make a factory go faster. And he goes and meets this guru who only gives him a little bit of time. And every time he asks him, he f they basically the thought is, find the bottleneck, fix the bottleneck. Now in Wi-Fi, we can find the bottleneck and we can fix it by doing all sorts of things. Like if you need to find the bottleneck on a server, I used to do compact server stuff, like back when compact was a thing. And if you threw more RAM at it, the server got better. It could have been a disk IO problem, but you just kept throwing more RAM and it made it go, it looked like it went away. We can throw more and more bandwidth at something and it looks like we fixed it, but we really haven't. So what we need to do is figure out what's the real bottleneck. Years ago, uh, what's that, three and a half years ago? Lee Badman was working at a campus in upstate New York and he was trying to explain to someone why they couldn't fix the problem. And they said, but it's just Wi-Fi. How hard is it to work without wires? And so he wrote on the, literally on the back of a napkin this little picture. That you have a client with a stupid person talking to an AP, which is in the, a circle. It's like a football. It's a special kind of AP. They're round. Uh, talks to a switch, talks to a controller, talks to the network. The network has these other services. There's a connection. Then there's the internet and destination. Each one has this thing. And he had this. And I thought at the time, hey, that's kind of a cool way to see the world. And I've used that as a starting point. So I just want to give credit to Lee because th th this is where this started in my head. Now we have this problem. We would like the world to be simple. Occam's razor. More things should not be used than are necessary. That's what he said. Well, actually, he said it in Latin, but I couldn't read the Latin. But we normally interpret this as being, if all things are the same, the simpler one's probably the right answer. So I like simple. Simple's good. Occam's razor is a nice thing to go through your life using. But in the real case, when it comes to Wi-Fi, it's more like the right side. Simple but wrong, everyone heads that way, or complex but right. And the problem with Wi-Fi is we're on the right side. We're not on the left side. And we think Wi-Fi is simple because some people say, oh, this is Wi-Fi. And how many of your customers have ever told you well, I, it works at home. All I did is I went down to the store, bought one, put it in, and it works. How hard can it be to just scale up? Actually, really hard. So I came up with this structure. This took months of my life and hundreds of emails and talks with tons of people to try to gather this up. And what it is, is what does it take for a client to say Wi-Fi is working? Because when they say Wi-Fi is not working, one of these things could break. Uh, there's a lot of bubbles on here. <clears throat> and then they got or organized in a whole bunch of different ways until we got something that could be repeatable. We have an end user who talks to a client. The client device is mobile. We has to associate, has to go through all this, hits the AP. Note the AP is wired and wireless, two sides. We have the wired network and we have the WAN network on the other side. And each little bubble has a process that needs to take place. So when someone says, oh yeah, this didn't work, this is now a structure or a format we can come back to and say, did it fail here or here or here? What was the pieces that went? And then for each one of these bubbles, we have a list of all the things that might have gone wrong at that bubble. So I think there's 36 bubbles and there's right now over 250 individual items, which is why we're over on the complex side. Any one of these things could be going wrong. Any one of these little factors here, one little teeny thing, could be the thing that we're trying to troubleshoot. And I really appreciate you taking pictures, but the last slide has a link and you can go get them all. <laughs> but thank you, I mean, I appreciate that. So 
This is the detail, and I'm obviously not gonna spend my little time going through this. Just realize it's here, and you need to think through these. So we need tools. Since RF is un, unremarkable as far as a human's concerned, we can't see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, anything. None of our senses, even our sense of balance. You know, they say we have five senses, but a sense of balance, that would make six. You know, right? How about a sense of foreboding? That would make seven. We actually have lots of senses, but none of our senses can sense RF. So we need tools that help us see the unseen, feel the unfelt. So looking at a set of tools, I went, well, should we make a process? Troubleshooting Wi-Fi is do this, then this, then this, then this. And then I looked at people like Peter McKenzie, Peter's great, he does troubleshooting all the time. But when Peter comes on site, he gets out his OmniPeak and he starts a packet capture because that's in his soul. He has to. He wakes up in the morning and he has angst if, they, if he's not looking at packets. True. Me, I'm a, I'm a validation guy. I go on site and the first thing I pull out is Ekahau and I do a survey and they're like, why are you surveying? Our problem's over here. I went, yeah, I, I have to know, where did you get the RF coverage where it is? Because I know, having done lots and lots of troubleshooting, that if the RF doesn't meet the requirement, you gotta fix that first. Peter comes at it one way. Other people go, well, I just sit down and I fire up uh, um, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, and I look at it and I can see, oh, wait, there's two 160 gig meg channels. Yep, but I know there's a problem. And so there's a lot of tools and there's a lot of ways to troubleshoot. And I don't want to even think of saying those are the right way is start here and go there. So we came up with a technique that said, we can come at this problem from any direction. At the center, at the core, are requirements. Client devices need certain things. Now, if you go to Cisco's website or Apple or Vocera, what does a Vocera badge need for primary coverage? 165, two IPs. Both at 65. So you have a primary 65 and a secondary 65. At what point does Vocera, he's just sitting in the front row, so I'm going to pick at him. What, what point does Vocera think it has coaching interference? It will, at here, it will listen. At here, it will ignore. Uh, minus 85, I believe. Hmm. So. For that one device, we have primary coverage, secondary coverage, and we know what you, at what point do you calculate? What, how many Vocera badges per AP, per radio, sorry? Five per radio. Tops. Five per radio. So as you go to the vendor, you find the information, you build it in here, and now I know when I use any one of these tools, I need to meet that requirement. How about DFS channels? No. No, okay. So when I'm over here and if I come in from the validation side, I'm going along, I can put into ECHO and say, I want 65 primary, 65 secondary, code channel inference, no more than one at 85 or better on the channel, and I need no more than five devices per radio. And then I can walk around and I can get an answer. Peter can use his tool and get to the same answer. You can use any one of these tools and come back and look at the requirements. Part of the problem I see in our industry is most of our customers don't even know their own requirements. They just go, oh, well, we need Wi-Fi to work. Yep, yep. And then when it doesn't work, you're like, why does it not work? I don't know. It just needs to work. On which devices? All of them. Where? Everywhere. When? All the time. <laughs> and like, but we know the Wi-Fi doesn't work that way. Okay. So we have, I put tools into a bunch of categories. Investigate tools have to do scanners. Uh, in the, the output of investigation tools is usually a table. These APs, these columns, these channels, I have a big set of data. Now from that data, I can do a lot of troubleshooting. Measurement tools are performance based. Sometimes it's a client, I'm walking around and a voice, I, it, does it drop a call? I'm measuring in real world. Validation is, looking at the RF that's collected through some graphical map-based tool. Where can I see that? Do I have a coverage hole? By the way, has anyone asked you to find a coverage hole? I have never in the past 14 years seen a coverage hole anywhere in the world, ever. People are always complaining about it. I'm like, really? 
Though my, my best ones, I walk in and I go, oh, we're going to be at this for a while? Let's listen to Spotify. Anna, what kind of music do you like? And they'll tell me, oh, well, you like country western? Okay, I can live with that. And I put it in my pocket, listen to Spotify, and we go to the place that has the coverage hole. And the music's playing. And my phone is pinging their device. And they get there and they go, yeah, right here, this is the hole. I said, how do you know? Because it made me put in my password. How does putting in your password have anything to do with Wi-Fi? Well, we dropped coverage, and so then it triggered, and it told me to put in my password. Yeah, the music, you hear it? It's coming over Wi-Fi. There's Wi-Fi right here. Really? And I'm pinging your device. Yeah, what? And your device is pinging my device. We're having a conversation over Wi-Fi right now. Well, then why did it make me put in my password? Good idea. Very good question. Has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. Haven't seen a covered soul. So we also have uh, analysis, spectrum analysis, looking at how do we see the RF. And we use spectrum analysis tools. They're great. Uh, I used to hardly ever use them when they cost $20,000. Now that they're more affordable, you use them all the time. Packet analysis, Peter's favorite. And then the top one, and that's just, I left it for the end because so many people think that that is actually the only way to troubleshoot. It's coming in through your vendor. You come in with your controller, and you look at it, and you ask the controller a question, how healthy is this? And there's a ton of troubleshooting you can do from a controller, from the controller's point of view. It's kind of hard to say, yeah, that client's having a hard time. And the controller goes, looks good to me. But the client's still having a hard time. We just have to realize for every one of these sets of tools, it's looking from a different point of view. So back to the little structure here. On the left side, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, there's a kind of a pinkish red box, the RF medium itself. So we broke it down into say, what could go wrong in this little box? So zooming into just this little box, in the RF medium, we have contention processes, MCS processes, overhead, DFS issues, and any one of these could be causing an issue. And they happen for every single frame. Some of them have little loops. So the contention process for every single transmission on a frequency, some device, could be the AP, could be a client, is going to have to figure out, is it my turn to talk? And there's an entire process to do this. You wait a diffs or an eighths, depending on how it's configured. You then pull a random number, and then you round, count a random slot time down. And along the whole time, you're doing a check to say, do I hear anyone else? On a preamble detect, on an energy detect, you have perhaps a uh, virtual detect going on at the same time, and you listen, 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 dead air, dead air, dead air. Oh, I win. I transmit. When I transmit, it tells everyone else to shut up. I talk for my period of time. There's a sip sack. Then we start over and play the game again. This happens for every single transmission. Now it's happening at the microsecond, so it's really, really fast, but it has to happen. We say, oh yeah, we're going to even make it go faster because we'll turn on QoS. And we'll change the AFES. We'll change the contingent window size. But it still has to do those same little things, just with slightly different numbers. So for every transmission, that has to happen. What happens if the, trans if the RF medium is busy? Well, now I have to go busy with what? Is it preamble detect busy? And there's a, a, a preamble detect CCA threshold. Is it energy detect busy? There's a separate one there. And by the way, the two of them are at least 100 times differential. Wi-Fi is 100 times more sensitive to other Wi-Fi than not Wi-Fi. I love when I ask people, yeah, turn us back in. What, what's going to cause interference? Oh, Bluetooth, why? Because it's in 2.4. So why is it causing a microwave oven? Really? You mean you go to the store to buy a microwave in the front, it says radiation generator, 1,100 watts, buy me. They're, they're not supposed to leak. And if they do leak, they're broken. They're leaking radiation in your house. Next one, MCS. For every single transmission, it doesn't matter if it's a client or an AP, the device that's about to transmit says, hmm, last time I was transmitting, what worked? What didn't work? How did I, pa how did I package the piece of information I wanted to send? I'm going to send a little piece in the front and back, etc. And then we have overhead and DFS. So any one of these things could go wrong 
in this RF medium. And we have to deal with all of them. We have to have tools to look at them and figure it out. So let's drill down. Contingent process. I just went through this. There is how we're going to access the medium to get my ticks up to then play through all these little things. And then if someone else hears me, they're going to hear my duration ID and they'll back off. Even if they don't hear my duration ID, they can't decode it. There's the length field and they'll still back off. There's a whole process here of saying, how do we access the medium? And by the way, this is the part that's inefficient compared to LTE. For modulation, for we could go a less complex modulation or a high complex modulation. The same device can do both. How does it determine? Well, it depends on what it did the last time. Did it work when I send a 256 qualm? I got to act back. Okay, I'll send the next one at 256 qualm. What if I didn't? Well, then I'm going to change and figure out something differently. Again, slow things take more time. Fast things take less time. If we want to get density in our Wi-Fi, we need to talk fast. Adding another AP does not add density. It may, but it's definitely not guaranteed. To add density, make people talk faster. Then they use less airtime. And the thing we have least of is airtime, so that's what we need to work on. So we get to this MCS table, and I show this all the time. It's in little notebooks. I whip it out when I'm talking to people. I'm not, De Devin Aiken has this memorized. I do not. That's why I carry it, because I, I can't, I, I tested him on it once. He's like, yeah, I have it memorized. I went, okay, what's MCS 15 at 80 megahertz? He just, boom, it's like, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> but if I, if I connect up, and in the association process, a client says, hello, AP, I'd like to join. And it does a little join. And then it says, what can you do? Oh, I can do this. I can do 866. And the AP says, I can do 866 too. And they negotiate and they say, okay, let's stay inside this box. I can do all these. You can do all these. So that's, we're going to talk. Then the next frame that's going to carry, and it's probably a DHCP request as payload says, okay, I would like to send you a DHCP request. And the client device goes, hmm, I can stay in this box. The AP can stay in this box. Should I package it with 256 QAM, coding of 506, using 80 megahertz channel with a short guard interval? So the payload is the same, a DHCP request. And then how do I package it? Well, the header is going to have a preamble and a header and a payload, and they each have their own different types of modulation. But I want it, the modulation, the payload to be this. And then I send it off. And the AP has only one thing it can do. It can either send it back to me with an ACK because it decoded it, or it does nothing. There is no, no, sorry, I didn't see it. Can you do this change? We have none of that. It's all one-way transmissions. In fact, this decision is 100% always, 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 always on the transmitter. So if it's the AP going down or the client going up, it's always on the transmitter and makes the decision. So if I do 866 and I fail, now here's where the problem is. For every client and every vendor, do I go up? This didn't work, so I have to find something else. Do I go to the left? Do I go diagonal? Do I skip to? Do I change columns? Do I go from here all the way up to there and try 6.5? Because 6.5, BPSK, slowest possible modulation, but is also the most robust. One of two coding, 100% redundancy on my coding. Long guard interval, 20 megahertz channel. This is the worst we can possibly make OFDM in Wi-Fi. Why would I go from here all the way up there? Because am I on the right AP? If I'm not even on the right AP, I'm a mobile device, I just woke up. Yeah, I can do this, he can do that, but can I? I'll go try this. If it works, then I can go down and over and down and over to work my way back. Every vendor has a different thing. Some vendors look at this column and say, and by the way, these are generic columns. They're not specific to anything. But Apple knows exactly for 866 what their SNR is. So instead of just wildly jumping down there, they go, oh, what's my current SNR? And what's my current RSSI? And where should I go? And my first attempt is where I am right now. That takes more intelligence. That means that roaming algorithm has to think through those and have a table and look. Some roaming algorithms will go back and go, yeah, last time I was at this GPS location, which BSSID was best? They remember things. So those are the things that could go wrong in the upper half. Now we're going to go down and look at the bottom half. We have a whole client. And by the way, the client device 
has a table of its own things that could go wrong. So I'm not even going to go there. But they do move. And then a client has to associate. Now, every association has to go up over the RF medium, right? It's going to have some probe request, probe response. Every one of those has to go up to the RF medium, wait, count down, get a timer, choose an MCS. All that's happening all the time for each one of these bubbles. And then the association process is going to happen. Then we're going to, if we associate, you have open, pre-shared key, or radius. If you have either of these two, you could do TKIP, it's deprecated, or AES, CCMP. Then you get the control port. <coughs> open goes no encryption. I guess you could have a pre-shared key with no encryption. It's possible. Silly, but, but possible. And then you get upper layers, then you finally get over here. So for every association, the client device has to make a decision between all of these things. One of the things that really that I hear a lot of when I ask this question what does your device use to choose which API I should join? And instantly everyone goes, RSSI. And there's a whole bunch of other things that it's choosing. Some devices also go, last time you talked to me, you were mean to me. I'm not going to come back to you again. OK, they don't use that voice, but <laughs> they, they, yeah. Some, some do, yeah. <laughs> some have heuristics. Some have weightless, grayless. Some say, well, what is, I'm going to guess what my MCS would be based on my current RSSI at this location from you. And then I'm going to pick the one that has the best possible MCS. Rather than just who's loudest, it's which one's going to give me the best. Hey, what about spatial streams? There's all, th this is just T. And then you get down here to KRV. Hold on. I feel so wrong, though. It's like, it's KBR. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, in respect, we'll, we will we'll do that. So how does it do this little process? Again, proprietary, totally proprietary. Because let's say I had an Apple TV. I'm going to stick in my house. It's a Wi-Fi device. I don't even know if I have one up here. Stickiness. Do you, if you were designing an Apple TV, would you want it to be sticky or not sticky? OK, that's a question. Would you want it to be sticky or not sticky? Why? Because it's not moving anywhere. It's just sitting still. And we have a whole bunch of devices that are wireless that don't move. Now, I think it's really silly. If it doesn't move, cable it. But that's a whole different story. But if I'm designing a device, I need to look at it and say, what do I want it to do? If I want it to sit on my shelf and I, it's in my you know, flat, and I don't want the neighbor who just bought the, you know, brand new Netgear Nighthawk with 18 antennas to take my Apple TV to them. I want my Apple TV to be sticky. <coughs> what about an iPhone? Not sticky. So the same manufacturer for every device is going to have a different algorithm. They have to. And now we're on the other side designing going, oh, for which device am I going to design my network to help give it what it wants? And everything wants something different. And our customers think, oh, it's all the same. This is one of those ones where you just go, hmm, memorize it. Association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. Association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. Association is to wireless what a link light is to wired. Because if you get a link light, do you troubleshoot up the stack or down the stack? Oh. Why? Because everything below is good enough. But you could troubleshoot down, and you'd be wasting your time. <laughs> right? I mean, it makes perfect sense in the wire. And we go to the wireless and people, yeah, we're going to do this. And you go, are you associated? Well, yes, but. There is no but. You're associated. You don't have a layer two problem. But it's slow. Now, that's an entirely different thing than saying, is Wi-Fi working? Client joins, chooses authentication versus encryption. We hit a port control. When we finish pa passing port control, we get an upper layer, DHCP, DNS, VLANs, default gateway, DNS, which gives us LAN access, which then leads us to the evil captive portals. <laughs> so if you have a captive portal, do you have a wireless problem? Impossible. In fact, back here, if I get an IP address, do I have a wireless problem? If I get an APIPA address, a 169, do I have a wireless problem? No. Because how did I get an APIPA address? I was associated, link light. I did a DHCP request because the link light trips the TCP stack. Or association 
trips the TCP stack. I do a DHCP request, it fails, and then I pull in a PIP address, which means Wi-Fi is working. Any of the upper layers? If these show up, Wi-Fi works, because how did you get them? Through the Wi-Fi. Now, I'm not saying there's not a problem with the red box, but there's not a problem with the bottom half of this. The top half is RF, and we might have a really low MCS. I might be going to BPSK. I might have a really totally overload. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong in the red box, but it's not in the bottom half. A big part of troubleshooting is knowing where to look. And then we hit the captive portal. And it has its own bunch of trouble. I'm not going to get into the amount of trouble that you could get into just a captive portal. Not to mention, people hate them. Does anyone here enjoy every 24 hours? <laughs> and what is this hotel gaining that they stopped and made you curse them every day? It's really good for their everything. You're like, oh yes, I hate you, hotel. And like over and over they do that to you for every device you own because somebody sold it to them and said, hey, we can give you this good marketing information that will tell you how many people hate you. <laughs> so we get two channels. By the way, where's, uh, let's see. Anyway, the, I've had this channel chart for a while. We updated it to have new stuff. I added all these frequencies because I went to a microtech class earlier this summer and they don't use channels, they use frequencies. They use the word channel for spatial streams, and they use streams for now. <coughs> so of all the channels, we have so many channels. People ask, which channel should I use? 160, 80, 40, 20? And I have a really simple answer. Use the biggest you can until you can't. If you don't know how you can't and how to show you can't, then use a small one. But if you can prove an 80 is the best, I'm, I'm all for 80s. I bet you run 80 at your house because you know 80 works. But if you run 80 in an airport, probably not a good smart thing to do. Or in a hospital, run 160s in hospitals. <laughs> and then we had a nice talk yesterday about DFS. Thank you, Homa, about where it is. And this process is also happening all the time. Every single second that AP is listening, doing this little bit. This is kudos to, actually it's also a lead into your next session, which is gonna be good, is what happens for, this is a single transmission on the air. The only part that's payload is blue. The differences are depending on whether or not we're AMPDUs up here and data rate down here. So we have an eighths, dead air. And then there's a contention window, we pick a random number. And then there's a preamble that gets sent to BPSK. And then there is a RTS that goes at the lowest basic rate. And then there's a SIFS, which is a fixed time. And then there's a preamble that goes at BPSK. And then a CTS that makes the rate. And then another SIFS at time. And then I send my preamble. Always preambles go at BPSK, so they go really far so everyone can hear them. And then we have a, another preamble at VHT added by a header at the minimum ba da basic rate. And finally, we hit our payload at whatever our phi rate is. Then there's a CRC. Then there's a SIFS, a preamble in BS, BPSK and then ACK. All of these steps have to take place to deliver that one blue thing. Is it very efficient? That, the word efficient doesn't even come into it. That. And so if we go and say, oh, I went from slow data rate to fast data rate, I'm so much better. <laughs> And then our users go, yeah, I put in 1.3 gig on my Mac. How come I don't have it? Well, you n never had it. So, and anyway, obviously upper layers. So we talked about this side. And again, every single bubble has a list of things to do and tools that you'd use at that bubble to do little fixing. Then we cross from the AP has two sides, wireless side, wired side. Wireless side is a hub, wired side is a bridge. And it's gonna bridge in between converting 802.3 to 802.11. And then it can over on this side. Then we have the wired medium. What happens if you use a Cat3 cable to hook up an AP? Does it work? Yeah, that's, that's the one that whenever people say, yeah, wireless. And, and like, it works. No matter what you do wrong, Wi-Fi still works. It just works poorly. 
If you hook up a Cat3 cable to it, AP, the AP will work. What if you take it outside 100 meters? Will it work? Yeah, it just goes slower. So we have to deal with our cable. If you're doing outdoor, by the way, you also have to make sure your grounds are the same. Because if you take an outdoor AP and you take that little green lug on the back and you ground it to the pipe that you've got the AP mounted to, and then you have an ethernet cable back to a switch inside, the inside switch has building ground, the outside switch has pipe ground. If there's a differential, the way ethernet works, it uses ground differential. And so if you have two different grounds, it will still work, but it'll only work at 100 meg.gig. And so you'll be troubleshooting why Wi-Fi is slow forever. And it's not even, and you can hook up the cable tester to the cable, it's Cat6 cable. You can hook something up and you can run an individual device at gig rates. You hook the AP back up and it goes 100 meg. So you log into the AP trying to figure out what's wrong and it says it's 100 meg. Ethernet, just, so we have to deal with wired. We have switches, TCP, DHCP, QoS, all of these pieces, any one of which could have a problem. And if I have a DHCP problem and I have a wireless client, from the end user standpoint, I have a wireless problem. I don't. Troubleshooting has nothing to do with wireless. Troubleshooting this has to do with DHCP. We need to know where it is. Oh, sorry. Oop. So we have all of these we need to deal with. I'm obviously not gonna get into the detail of this. This is also very vendor centric. Whose switches are you running? Whose routers you're running? Whose firewalls are running? Whether or not you have a captive portal here or here. Is your controller here or here? All those issues. Dot one X is over here. Dot one X is also over here. There's authentication database. The database actually be by here. There's, yeah, it's complex. And when we go to troubleshoot, we need to understand this whole framework. So how did we make the wired medium better? When I first got into this, we were running silver satin telephone cable. Then we went to Twisted Pair, then Cat3, Cat5, Cat6. We went from one meg to one gig. How do we make our copper go a thousand times faster? Did we somehow use better copper? No. Did we make it go shorter distance? Did we increase the speed of light? How did we make copper go 1,000 times faster off the same copper with the same distance with the same speed of light. We lowered interference. All the little fancy things we did were to lower crosstalk, near side crosstalk, far side crosstalk, pinouts, twist ratios, all those things. But the result was we lowered interference. So, ready? How do we make Wi-Fi go faster? Okay, that, I set that up and you're just sitting there with, man, just leave me hanging out here. How do we make Wi-Fi go faster? We lower interference. What's the number one cause of interference in Wi-Fi? Wi other Wi-Fi. Why? Because Wi-Fi is 100 times more sensitive to Wi-Fi than other Wi-Fi. If we have a problem with Wi-Fi, it's probably because we have too much Wi-Fi. How many of you, just raise your hands, have ever done a survey, done troubleshooting, and found that you have too many APs? Sales guys, you should look at this. <laughs> but I only get commission when I sell more APs. But from a troubleshooting standpoint, that's kind of counterintuitive. Putting in another AP doesn't help. You can still sell them. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> That works. So on the local network, we have all these other things that need to be fixing. Every single one of them has a problem. In fact, these are only subsets of what it could be. And we're out here trying to troubleshoot and go, yeah, Wi-Fi has a problem. Yeah. Which is why we put the chart and you can look at it and go, oh, is it here, there, and then where do I go to look? So one of the fast things we can do ourselves, but I would like you to teach this technique to your end users. Because if your end users can do this, actually, Anders, who presented yesterday, oh, where'd he go? Anyway, not you, Anders, the other one, the smart one. <laughs> um, you're the smart Alec, so that's good. Um, 
he, he, he was showing that he could go and hit a button and say, what does the client see? What's the current MCS? What's here? Because that's a really good way to troubleshoot from the client's point of view. He put up his speed test where his own students and users of their network can go do a speed test and it comes back and it tells them how they're doing. That's wonderful stuff. I wish that was like public for everyone. But here's an example of something I did. I was at a hotel called, I think it's Premier Inn in, um, yeah, it was Extreme too. Yeah, no. And they had just bought all new Wi-Fi. They were so happy about it. And so this is in Dubai, a place called Silicon Oasis. And there's a brand new hotel right next to where all the IT guys are. And they put in really good Wi-Fi, 866. AP's offering 866, my MacBook's getting 866. I have 41 SNR, 49 signal strength. I'm at a 180 meg wide channel with MCS9. It does not get any better. The Wi-Fi is fantastic. And I run a speed test on that and I get one meg. <laughs> so I go down to the front desk. I'm like, I want to complain about your internet. And they're like, not again. We spent all this money on this Wi-Fi and you keep complaining. No, no, you have great Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is fantastic. And they like, felt a little better. But your backhaul sucks. And they went, no, no, we have an E1. <laughs> Very proudly, oh, for you at US people, it's like a super T1. It was two meg, two meg for, they had 280 hotel rooms and I was getting one of their two. I mean, I got half their bandwidth. <laughs> so you laugh, but it's really simple. All you have to do is go to your customers and say, tell me, how am I doing over the air versus how am I doing over the internet? Someone here was complaining uh, about, the, yeah, and as they should, the Wi-Fi in this. By the way, we do not check out hotels by their Wi-Fi. We wouldn't find any hotels to hold conferences in. Actually, the next WPC in Phoenix I did, one gig backhaul. I tested it. It was so cool. Um, so how do we get this to our end users? They need to know this information. Because if they call to the help desk and say, yes, Wi-Fi is working great, but... Wi-Fi is working great, but my DHCP response took seven seconds. That would really help them solve the real problem. So we need to be able to quickly tell, is it wired or wireless? And how can we tell? Because we have MCSs. MCSs are wonderful because for every single frame, it went through that little loop and said, oh, I tried this, it didn't work, so I tried this, it didn't work, so I tried, oh, this is what works. Every single frame on Wi-Fi self-reports and says, my RF experience is. All you have to do is grab the frame and it will tell you how the RF is. You can't have terrible RF and have a high MCS. They don't work that way. And it's self-reporting. Now, every client can make some different decisions. But if I'm saying in MCS 678, and I'm moving around. I can also have stable MCS. I can have floppy MCS. I can have the MCS where I change two streams, one stream, two stream, one stream. There's some issues. But as long as I'm 64 qualm or better, I have good RF. And if end users know that, then they can make better decisions. So when I talk to the manager, he's like, we're well, the one who said he was proud of his T1, his E1. He goes, is there something more? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. So, wired issues need wired tools. Wireless issues need wireless tools. Now, last night in this room, we saw NetAlly has some tools that do both. But we need to be able to use the correct tool to find the correct problem. If I'm running a Link Sprinter, great tool, or a NetTool IO, test Ethernet, it's not going to tell me anything about this over here. And if I'm looking at layer one RF with this back end, it's gonna tell me whether or not my DNS server is pointing to the wrong place. So use the tools you need in the right place where you need them. So some hints on how to do, tell the difference between wired and wireless. If you have an IP address, it's a wired, wired problem. If you can ping the Wi-Fi client, it's a wired problem. There's nothing wireless about it because I pinged it. I can check the MCS of the client. I can compare throughputs, like I did in the last one, between the wireless throughput and the wired throughput, which is why, oh, where's my little, oh. WM Pies solve the problem. I take the WM Pi and I stick it behind the AP. It has a little HTML5 speed test. You tell your users to hit this, 
and it tests the air to here. It, then they go, well, that was like 300 meg, but why is the internet slow? Well, I know it's not the wireless, so we have a little thing you can carry with you, proof to show which side it's on. Check your RSSI and SNR. If they're really low, you might be lucky and have a fairly decent MCS, but only lucky. If they're really high and you have a bad MCS, you go, oh, it's not RSSI. Adding another AP is not gonna fix it. If I have a low MCS, but a high SNR, yeah, let's go let's use some other tools to find out why. And is it an isolated issue? Is it me? Is it everything on this side of the building? <coughs> Did everyone, I had a place that they're like, no one can get on the internet. Can you fix our wireless? Just say that sentence again. The entire building, no one can get on the internet. What about your wired desk? Yeah, he can't get on either. Can you fix our wireless? Yeah, kind of hard. So if you wanted to see the resources from here, I made a URL pretty easy, wmpros.com slash troubleshooting. All the graphics, all the pictures, feel free to use them. Uh, if you find on that big, huge list that had all the... 250 things. If you have more, we'll make a bigger. Wait, are you ready? Oh, I was gonna change it right when you did that. So, you can use this to help troubleshoot. You can use this to troubleshoot. And, oh, how did I get there? Oh, it was just tacked on the end of my thing. There we go.